Deep on a Raccoon City during the events of Resident Evil 3, Jill would encounter a form of creature that still possessed its human form, but strangely was able to resist most of what she could put down range to stop it. Apparently this was the norm, as previously the group working on these abominations had requested stronger ordinances in a preemptive measure in case of an outbreak or escape, and if it were to take place. Whether it wasn't delivered on time, or entrusting a bunch of nerds in the basement to secure the labs was a bad idea, it seems to have been irrelevant as it led to the same outcome. Shambling around the underground facility, facility, these creatures known as Paleheads appear to be slow and dim-witted, but in reality, they are much more of a threat than a standard infected. So in today's episode, we will discuss where that threat comes from and biologically, what is taking place at their cellular level to make them so resistant to damage. As Jill continues to run away from Nemesis, she ends up going deeper and deeper into Umbrella's underground facility. However, unlike Leon, who ends up specifically in the research labs, Jill ends up in the shipping department. While moving through, she ends up running across Nikolai, who has sequestered himself within a portion of overlooking the storage room. Jumping down, you find some bodies on the floor that appear quite strange, but also familiar. These bodies are roughly the size of an average human, they possess exceedingly pale skin and virtually no hair on their bodies, overgrowths of skin appear across the bodies, and some damaged areas centralized to their torso and legs. As they begin to get up and stumble their way towards Jill, obviously after everything that has happened, firing upon these creatures is a priority. However, when she does this, these creatures seem to be able to take a hit regardless of location from a standard handheld. Their bodies seem to be able to absorb the impact with little to no detriment even concerning the head. This would say quite a few things about their internal biology, but what's most interesting is after taking damage, steam can be seen rising from their bodies as they continue to walk around in an ungainly fashion. Moving deeper within the facility, we begin to see evidence that there is really some concern about the creation of these creatures and their containment. Finding certain requisition forms, it became clear that should there be an escape or any form of outbreak, then the security and scientists located within the lab would be ill-equipped to deal with a full-scale jailbreak requesting the heaviest of ordinances to put down these creatures, anything less than a mag or boomstick is really just like throwing rocks at them. After Umbrella essentially abducted many people from the surface utilizing Chief Irons and then brought them down to the facility for testing, there appears to have been some sort of security measures that failed while everything else was going to absolute crap, resulting in the release of BOW experiments and the Pale Heads being included in that. So what exactly makes these creatures so dangerous? Well, clearly it must have to do with mitosis and connective tissue, but before we get to their infection process and why they turned out different than others, as well as some of their strengths that they possess as a result of this mutation, we must first learn about their morphology, which should lend some clues as to what's happening internally. Starting with the feet, we see a theme that will progress throughout the rest of the body. They are plantigrade in structuring with the heels on the ground like you or I. However, they appear to almost have an overgrowth of pale white skin covering their feet. This overgrowth is much thicker than the thin skin Homo sapiens naturally produce or possess. The toes also seem to have an overgrowth extended to them, making them appear much much more stubby by normal comparison. Moving up to the shins and legs, we can see the skin almost appears like connective tissue. Stretching over the muscle underneath, it crisscrosses itself, producing pockets and areas that appear thin in comparison with other areas. On the back half of the calves, there appears like there is some damage, although it could be just an area that is not currently experiencing the massive growth of tissue. Moving up to the thighs, we can see that the skin is smoother on the right thigh. Here we can also see on the back that the skin is bunched up about mid-femur. This patch is likely the dermal layers produced too many skin cells. This would have long-term effects and issues like tissue death, which we can see if we swing over to the left leg. The left leg has more of the pitting and stringy tissue. Now, this could be because of the actual tissue suffering the ill effects of having too much skin around it and not enough oxygen, or it could really just be the early stages of packing on too many cells. Moving to the pelvic area, we actually see something fairly interesting, if not a little gross. I mean, let's be real. You know why you're here. It is an anatomical channel, so we gotta talk about anatomical things, right? This creature has a fold of skin completely covering where its gear used to be. Now, Umbrella may have actually removed any form of sex identification from those who were taken, or possibly, judging by the skin, maybe it grew over and reconnected. But I see this as unlikely. The reasoning is, if these traits were removed, then the body would heal, as we will discuss later, and this would actually cause an increase in tissue in this area. Moving up to the abdomen and chest, we see that the skin has continued to grow over what was originally there. First, the belly button has now completely been covered, meaning that this is a new addition. The chest is unchanged concerning the size, which means that the underlying skeletal structures are largely unchanged, but again, more sinewy skin covers up the chest, erasing any features that were there previously. The shoulders and arms are largely unchanged, however, in the left elbow, it appears to be a patch of skin that is original and has only recently been adding the pale skin, meaning that this process appears to take time. Moving down to the hands, they are not changed all that much either, so there's no claws, no extra appendages, just really standard hands. But getting to the face, that's where the moneymaker is. 
face. Here we can see the effects of rampant growth as it has heavily affected the face. First, the teeth within the mouth are mostly covered up. Some have been lost and this is likely due to the actual overgrowth of dental tissue. The pressure would have destroyed the nerve in most teeth and caused them to fall out. The gums themselves seem to be larger than normal as well, giving some credence to this idea. The nose has become twisted and really is just a couple holes in the face. Now, this wasn't likely due to damage, but instead, as the skin began to spread, this pulled on like cartilage in the skin of the nose that was already there, and when it did, this would plaster the nose down, changing its shape and appearance. Moving up to the eyes, we see that they are largely covered, likely obscuring a lot of the pale head's vision. This would be detrimental to its BOW status, as you can get rather close before they notice you. This overgrowth appears to stem from the actual brow line, which may indicate that, although not much, some skeletal overgrowth may be occurring. And the actual shape of the head may be a pretty good indicator of this as well. The overall shape of the skull is misshapen, however, this also could just be the scalp of the person going into cancerous levels. So with the overall morphology peeped, getting a good look at this thing, I gotta say, it's pretty fugly. It sort of reminds me of a Sharpay mixed with a hairless cat. The extra skin is simply a consequence of the underlying faculties, so let's take a look at what caused this, what Umbrella was going for, and how did it affect the person internally. The infection that the pale heads have is different from your standard T-virus strain. In fact, it would appear that the pale heads should have been more mutated, but seem to lack crucial components to carry their infection into the stratosphere. Much like Nemesis and Mr. X, the pale heads possess the Epsilon strain that the Tyrant Project is known for. However, whereas the Tyrants were usually mixed with some other components leading to further mutations, it would appear that the pale heads are really just the outcome of an early stage at a minimal understanding of the T-virus. They would appear to possess the same resilience, though, as those afflicted with the Tyrant Project strain. But without the added benefits of further infection, they have suffered and degraded in their mental faculties, leading to essentially what could be considered a super infected, but still super dumb. Those infected with the T-virus, as we know, have their brains damaged to a large degree. They will walk around and shamble and really just possess poor problem-solving abilities. The same can be said for the pale heads as they shamble around. The main difference between them and an infected, then, would have to be their ability to recover from wounds and direct hits. When infected with the T-virus, it appears as though your cerebrum is also heavily damaged. So really, you're just relying more on instincts and the interior portions of your brain, such as the cerebellum and brainstem, which, if you didn't know, the internal portions are referred to affectionately as the lizard brain. But those infected cannot be reasoned with and instead follow what appears to be just the basic need to eat, which is exactly what these creatures do, and as a result, I can conclude that largely, the cerebrum must be brain dead at this point, and really have little or nothing to do with the operation of these infected. Because of this, much like how the normal infected can survive direct hits to the dome, so too can the pale heads. However, where they diverge is their ability to take these hits. Deep within every cell of the body when the T-virus worked its way through, it fundamentally changed the DNA of this person. The strain they received, however, was not the strain that the standard infected are afflicted with. This particular strain seems to have activated a portion of the DNA responsible for mitotic division and also likely damaged other areas. Now something I do need to bring up, mitotic division is an exceedingly complicated process despite how it's been broken down since grade school. There are several locations that have been discovered within our genetic coding that aid and assist in the division of our cells and these areas appear to all inspire certain functions that take place to assist with mitosis. In normal cells, this precise dance takes place that replicates the DNA, pulls the mostly identical copies over to either side of the splitting cell, and then splits the cellular membrane producing two daughter cells. This gives us smooth skin, repaired muscle, strengthened bones, and sometimes even new neural connections as a result. However, this process seems to be somewhat bastardized within the pale heads. Getting a look at their bodies, we see this process as far from perfect. Overgrowths of skin tissue in the body are a pretty clear indicator of this. Potential changes within the skeleton also seem to suggest that as time passes, other issues may begin to arise with mobility and viability. Interestingly though, the thing that makes them so tough may be their undoing. So the thing about mitosis is, it isn't perfect, and this is what causes aging in animals. Every time our cells divide, we can really have mutations happen during the replication process. Some of our DNA may not separate entirely from the other portions of DNA, and then you sort of just get pulled into the daughter cell, and you might have too much DNA or not enough DNA, but the standard is, and this is just, let's say it's perfect replication and everything goes off without a hitch, usually our junk DNA continues to get shorter and shorter. Believe it or not, there is a ton of DNA in every cell that is virtually useless by our current understanding of genetics. And when our cells divide, some of this DNA is lost over time. And then eventually important DNA is destroyed through mitosis and this leads us to age. A pale head would have likely undergone the same issue, meaning that there are two possibilities. After the T-virus heavily affected the DNA of this person, I believe that it would either continue to divide 
solidified into a cancerous mass on the ground as their bodies continue to have more and more issues, or they would age rapidly due to genetic damage from increased strain of ramped up mitosis. Which, if you don't believe me that there is damage, it would appear as though the first sort of physiological trait that we can see is the extremely pale skin. When cells become damaged, usually it's not uncommon for the melanin within them to begin changing. Take skin cancer, for instance. Usually the skin turns darker. But if you end up actually affecting the genetic portion responsible for the release of melanin, you would get something like almost albinism, which is what we see in the pale heads. So why is this if mitosis is native to every living creature on the planet? And again, it goes back to small little issues as the process isn't perfect. When you cause damage to a pale head, we see something really cool actually that, you know, it's something I haven't seen in games, but it shows what's happening internally. Steam begins to come off of the pale head. It's not that it's cold inside the underground facility, but that the metabolic rate of the pale head is being locally increased. This is necessary as the cells undergo rapid division to repair muscle, bone, blood vessels, and the skin of the body from the hit that it just took. Increasing the metabolism and dividing the cells, this would likely, and actually not just likely, it does release a ton of heat. Now when these cells divide, as we just discussed, the process isn't perfect. At that rate of reproduction, there is no way that the DNA could be checked and corrected if there are mutations, meaning that eventually these creatures would drop and are exceedingly self-limiting by their own process of replication. So I feel like you guys probably have a pretty firm grasp on the cellular mitosis this thing undergoes as a result of damage. So now let's talk about resilience and why taking a shot to the face does nothing if the handheld isn't powerful enough. As mentioned in the notes that you find throughout, the body is not only resistant to damage but can repair itself. So it becomes about inflicting more damage than what the body can actually heal from. Body shots are almost virtually useless unless it's a mag or an acid round. Even the boomstick has trouble inflicting enough damage to do anything reliably, and that's likely because pellets don't really have a great ability to pierce really thick hide. But you may be sitting there thinking, well, what about a headshot? Again, don't forget about the damaged cerebrum, but also the compressional wave created. It appears that the brain of this creature is non-functional, meaning destroying it does very little. But it also depends on how you're trying to destroy it. If you have a standard handheld, the compressional wave from entering the skull would likely destroy parts of the cerebrum, but it wouldn't be enough. But if you use something like a mag, that's going to create a bigger wave, which can also destroy the lower portions of the brain. But really, the only true way to take this down is to replace enough of its cells with lead or air. Disrupt the chemical reaction of life, and the pale head will drop. But considering that chemical reaction in this creature is accelerated, it becomes more and more difficult and takes way more effort. The pale head, as mentioned, apart from its ability to heal from damage, is really not too special. It doesn't mutate into some giant beast or bite you in half if it gets close or make a Jill sandwich. Instead, it's really just a tough standard infected. Should you get close and it attacks, it will proceed to rip out your jugular or trapezius muscle, which leads to Jill's quick bleed out and vowing to come back with the most powerful weapon in the game to annihilate every one of them. But I would have to say in summation, this is simply just an infected with a runaway mitotic ability that will eventually lead to its end because there's no possible way that this will be self-sustaining with that much genetic damage for very long at all, which may have been what Umbrella was actually going for.